Well, yeah, like I said, we were talking about the weather. I figured it was going to be windy and rainy or maybe sleety or something, but boy, it's a perfect night, isn't it? Uh, I'm Sam Buchanan. I'm the general manager of the uh, JW Westcott Company. I'm also uh, one of their boat captains, and I run the boat uh, usually in the daytime, uh, but sometimes you might see me yeah. in the afternoons or overnight time uh, every once in a while. Um, a little bit about me. I've been with the company for 37 years. I started as a deckhand uh, way back in 1985. I've been affiliated with the folks there about 40 years. Uh, they don't hire you to your 18, though. So um, uh, I got a job there and loved it and uh, just stayed with it. Um, so I've been there well, for a while, and I've done just about every job in, that we can do there, including taking care of the cat. So um, I'll tell you a brief uh, uh, history of our company, um, and then I'll go along with uh, some of what we do today. And then uh, I find it really fun if we just open it up and ask, uh, let everybody just ask whatever you want to ask me. Does that sound good? Okay. Well, our uh, company, um, our, our company story kind of starts with a man named David Westcott. And um, he come to the Great Lakes uh, over in the Manitou Islands, and he come across a fellow named Z Zayel Ward. Um, some people re, uh, report his name as being Zeal Ward, but it was Zale Ward, Z-A-E-L. And he was a lighthouse keeper in the Manitou Islands area. And uh, Mr. Westcott fell in love with his daughter, Mary Jane. And they were riding a boat supposedly to get married in Detroit. And they just couldn't wait. And there was a justice of the peace on board. So they got married on the boat. And it was a boat called the James Madison. And it was the first recorded marriage on a steamboat on the Great Lakes. And it happened over near uh, Mackinac Island, Mackinac area there. And uh, so they got married and uh, well, went through their life. And when he married uh, uh, Mary Jane Ward, um, her brother was um, Eber Ward, who was in the steamship business. And his cousin was Eber Brock Ward, which is E.B. Ward, you may hear about. So this, there's no confusion there. And uh, Eber Ward uh, uh, went into uh, some other businesses and insurance and things like that. While his cousin brought the Bessemer steel process to the United States from England, he owned steamship interests, and he was actually the very the first millionaire in Detroit, and he it was the richest man in Michigan. And um, he lived right on 4th Street there in Detroit at 19th Street, which is now called St. Ann Street. The house is no longer there. And he died of a of a brain aneurysm on January the 2nd uh, in 1899, I believe it was in downtown Detroit. So the richest man in the entire Midwest uh, just had an aneurysm and that was the end of it. But the Westcotts uh, uh, continued and they had a, a son named uh, John Ward Westcott, which is the founder of our company. And he was born in 1848 on Lime Island in the St. Mary's River. And uh, in following with his family, he um, got on a steamboat at the age of 12 as a cabin boy, and he worked his way up within that family business to become the youngest master on the Great Lakes at age 20. So as he was doing that, you know, he was really concerned with safety on the Great Lakes. He was concerned with how could he make business better and more efficient. So he um, uh, went along and started his marine reporting business in Detroit in 1874. And that business is now in its fifth generation of family ownership. And I'll go into how they got started there. As a steamboat master, he realized that a lot of times when these ships left the upper lakes, they had no communication with the rest of the world. So maybe when you left, your orders were to go to, say, to Cleveland, but those orders changed for some reason. And he could give you a last minute notice at Detroit that your orders had changed, or maybe you need to slow down, or maybe you need to go somewhere else or something. Uh, anything that was urgent, that he, he would be able to get it out to the ships. So he became a very trusted individual with steamship orders and everything, and all of the fleets trusted him. And he was really big on that dependability and honesty and all the character traits that we love about people. And uh, he was able to help steamships companies be so efficient at what they were doing by just simply uh, transmitting messages back and forth. Well, he also established the first light ship on Lake St. Clair. And then later on, he put the range lights that are in uh, to serve uh, at Windmill Point there to guide ships into the Detroit River because it could get pretty treacherous where Lake St. Clair fills into the Detroit River. 
So the U.S. government was always on his tail. So they, of course, put their own light ship there. Then they put their own range lights there. So they went up to near Gray's Reef in Lake Michigan and put a light ship there. Well, it wasn't long after that. Here come the Coast Guard and uh, the United States uh, again. And they put their own light ship there. Well, so he has this marine reporting and mail business going in Detroit. So the post office again says, we'll put our own boat there. So he had a, there he is, U.S. mail boats, and then there was J.W. Westcott's boat. And the reason he was able to stay in business was because he's still giving the messages, and the companies knew they could trust J.W. Westcott. You could give him a message, and he's going to give it to the ship, and he's not going to share that information. Whereas if you give it to somebody that you don't know, so he was able to compete with the U.S. government. Finally, the government, um, and I'm not sure the year, but they decided that they would contract out the service. So there were other owners um, competing against J.W. Westcott running the U.S. mail for many years. And as it got through time, uh, pretty much the last operator was, the, uh, was a fellow named Oliver F. Mook, M-O-O-K. And he suddenly died in the middle of his contract. And he was a sole guy on the contract, so they null and voided it. And then the postal contract was handed over to the Browning Company. And the Browning Brothers, of course, owned the T.H. Browning Steamship Company. And in 1948, the contract had come up for renewal. So J.W. Westcott, of course, had already been doing mail. And the Brownings were more um, uh, concentrated on buying Bob Lowe Island at the time. So they allowed J.W. Westcott to go ahead and freely take the contract, and we've held that ever since 1948. So um, what we do um, there uh, up into this day is uh, we service vessels 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, weekends and holidays included, seven days, yes, uh, uh, all hours of the day and night um, from about the first week of April to the last week of December. And sometimes you may see the mailboard a little earlier than that. You may see the mailboard a little bit uh, later than that, just kind of depending on what uh, is going on that particular year. So, but as a rule, it's going to be the first of uh, April to the, about the third week in December. Or so, so what do we do today? Well, we do just about everything. Uh, if it's U.S. mail, uh, we have a post office in our building, and the mail comes in addressed to a person, and hopefully they have the boat name on the end of it or the package, and we sort it into each individual um, vessel's slot. If the mail is too big for the slot, then they get assigned a place on the counter or they get into a mail bag. And when the vessel is approaching our station, they, things have changed in 35 years. It used to always be a call on the radio, we're an hour away, what do you have for us? And now they may, they may send you a Facebook message, they may send you a text message, they may call you on the radio, it may be a phone call. It, it's anyway nowadays, uh, things have changed so much. Uh, J.W. Westcott would probably be astounded if he could see all the different things that uh, the, the, the way you can communicate now as to the way it was back then. And over the years, we had other stations because one of the first things we were was a marine reporter. And what that is, is the steamship companies didn't know necessarily when their boats were going by a certain spot. So our office would keep track of everything that went up or down the river and then telegram that, that information to the company's offices. So we had a reporting station at Port Huron, and we had a reporting station in Amherstburg, Ontario, up until about 1960 or so. Um, our Port Huron station was taken out by a freighter, so they, they closed it after that. Uh, I believe that was the Benson Ford that ran into our station and destroyed it. But um, anyway, uh, that was the end of the Port Huron operation. But we had these small, go fast wooden boats at the Port Huron station that would run out, and we would put people aboard. And so that's something that we still do to this day. Um, so if you can think about anything that a Great Lakes ship would need, we try to provide it. And we are also, um, as you may or may not know, um, uh, vessels that visit the Great Lakes from overseas, we call them salties, they are required to have a, a, a pilot on board uh, while they're on the Great Lakes. And Detroit is one of the places where they change pilots. So since 1959, we have been the pilot boat for the Port of Detroit as well. Um, so, um, again, 24 hours a day, if a ship's coming up down the river, you can see us out there doing the pilot change. Um, we do groceries for some of the boats that go by. Uh, we do uh, important freight parts. Um, we will transfer parts from one ship to another. 
Um, they'll, uh, if say a ship needs a part, a spare part, and another ship has it, they'll put it off at our place and then we'll put it aboard the next ship going by or whoever needs it for that matter. Um, we have, um, we're accepting DoorDash deliveries now. We have those instant card orders. Just put your boat name on it or we want to eat your food. That's happened, I'm telling you. Um, we get uh, a lot of boats. Uh, just the other day when the weather was so bad last Sunday, one of the boats was in Detroit. And he said, you know, we don't have a good cook. We'd like some pizza. Could you bring us some pizza down? So we, uh, it was pretty heavy waves out there too, but our crew actually delivered the pizza about two miles down the river to a ship that was tied up. And uh, we do that a lot. Um, boats will call for White Castle or McDonald's or ice cream, or you know, and we're there to take their call. Um, a lot of folks order Amazon packages, and we'll take their uh, we'll, we have we receive them and put them on the shelf. We do charge a little bit. If it's not U.S. mail, you have to pay our company to receive your stuff and then hold it for you and take forty-seven phone calls asking if it's there or not. Um, and then we'll deliver it to you when you go by, or if you change boats three times or you get fired and you're not there and you want to set back to your house or whatever. We do all of these extra things. Now, when I first started there, we used to, um, when there was a thing called newspapers, you guys remember those? Um, we would send the vessel passages every day to the Detroit News, letting them know what boats went up and down the river. And we had to put that information in the telex machine and every day. And I would always stress out because I'm not a very really good typist. And you're sitting there and you're pushing these little keys and they got to get the white out out and you got to push some more. Then it, we gradually uh, went to where the computer would do it. And then finally we had a program to where whatever we put in there, it would just send it to Detroit News. Hopefully they would, we don't get death threats so we didn't put them in there that day or something, you know. People would get very upset if the vessel passages were not in the paper. We had nothing to do with it. You know, so um, that was one of the other things that we used to do um, uh, way back in the day, uh, ships would put off a hardware order for a hardware store over in Cleveland or in Erie or somewhere, and we would always send those messages to the company, hey, they want four hammers today, or they need this, or they need that. Um, we used to take strange requests from people for, like I said, for food. Um, uh, folks, for our guy, our guy called me the other day, he wanted two tubes of chapstick. <laughs> And, uh, and we, you know, we're, uh, we're one of the only places on the Great Lakes that you can still get cigarettes, too, because cigarettes have become so expensive, most of the other uh, channelers don't want to deal with them. But we won't sell them by the package. We only will sell them by the carton. And the guy got rather upset that I wouldn't sell him two packages of cigarettes. And there was a reason for that. And I, I tell my people at work, I said, if you buy, if you charge to go out and get something and it's only one pack of cigarettes and you charge $10, but he's going to get really angry and tell everybody on the boat that you charged him $18 for a curtain cigarette, for a package of cigarettes as opposed to the whole curtain. So we, uh, we kind of try to adjust that kind of stuff, but we'll get toothpaste for people. Um, people call their prescriptions into a local pharmacy and we'll go pick them up. Um, if you send your medicine through the mail and it needs to be refrigerated, we do that too. Uh, I had a guy the other day door dashed ice cream to us. So we put it in the freezer. Uh, we had some stuff that came in door dash and I, it did not, it only had a person's name on it. So I'm, in, I'm going up in the neighborhood. I'm trying to figure out where this person may be because there was stuff in there that just didn't seem like it should go on a boat. It was baby food and all kinds of stuff. So I said, man, this stuff looks pretty tasty, you know? So uh, about a week goes by and somebody finally calls and says, hey, that's my stuff. And I'm like, well, we ate it. <laughs> you know? So nothing's worse than when a DoorDash loop can't find our place and the ship goes by before it gets there. Then, but that's good for us. It's bad for the people on the boat. Um, well, another thing we do is uh, who transfers. Uh, you need to get off your ship uh, or you need to, to replace you with another worker. We'll do that. And um, or if you have a, an emergency, you need to get off. You can always, uh, if you're in the, anywhere in the Detroit or the Rouge River, the mailboat will come get you and get you off and get you to the airport. We arrange rides for folks and everything. We do a lot of things. Uh, 
You know, our, our paperwork still says we're marine reporters, which we are, and we're vessel agents, which we are. We will actually act on folks' behalf. I mean, I've arranged fuel loans for people where uh, we had a tugboat come down the river one time and he didn't have credit at the fuel dock, so I let him put it on our ticket and then they paid us for the fuel, you know, so that works out pretty good. Um, we've had boats pull into our dock that were low on fuel. <laughs> uh, we had a big yacht one time come in. I mean, this humongous yacht, and he needed fuel. So come on in, you know. Um, back before 9-11 and all that, when things were, were not so wild, we, we actually pulled a ship into the park next door to us one time. They had uh, a part that needed to be put aboard, and it was too big for the mail boat. So we said, just pull into the park. So they did. And uh, we had a crane come down and put their part on for them. Yeah, yeah, those were, the, those were the good old days. Yeah, go ahead, you had a question. Where is your office in Docks? Okay, she, uh, the question is, is where is our office in Docks? And we are located right at the, we call it the foot of 24th Street. That's the first address off the river on 24th Street. And there's a park there that's being rebuilt right now called Riverside Park. And our office sits right in that little park there. It's about a quarter mile below the Ambassador Bridge, right in the turn of the river. So it's kind of strategically placed uh, for what we do. And prior to that, we were at the foot of Third Street downtown and also at the foot of First Street. But when our, um, our founder, uh, Captain Westcott, started the business, we were at Joseph Campo Street. And when he started this business, he rode out to the ships. He didn't have a motorized vessel to carry him out there. So he would actually row out. Then later on, they would take a steam tug and tow a rowboat out. And that's how they did it. Instead of taking the boat alongside, it was the rowboat. So what would happen is they would, you would row alongside, throw a line up, and they would pull you along until you did the uh, mail down the river. Here's my feeling. The mail comes down just like this in a bucket most of the time. And some boats have great buckets. Some boats have milk crates. Some boats don't have any bucket at all. And uh, this is a uh, standard mail bag. This is one of the old style right here. Remember I told you if the mail's too big for the box, uh, you get a bag. And then we simply just tie this around the line and up she goes. Keeps it nice and dry. Unless you're like the guy last week that dropped the bucket completely into the river like he was he was uh, looked like he was dipping for water or something. Like, no, no, no. We got to get that back up before the mail floats out. But uh, we have our own special stamp that we stamp the letters with when it comes off, and we put it into the system. Yep. You have a question? How many workers do you have? It sounds like you need a lot of people. Uh, the question is, how many workers do we have? And on our staff right now, we have about twenty people, and we uh, run three shifts a day with either two or three people on each shift. And because uh, people don't, you know. So it's a lot of work. So we have a lot of relief people for vacation and so forth. Plus, uh, we have a van as well that goes out on the road and goes places. So if we get a grocery order for a ship, uh, we put our driver in that van. And you might wonder, well, what kind of orders and things do you get? Uh, just last year, I got a call from a steamship company. They said, um, our vessel is in Gary, Indiana, and we need a part. It won't start without the part. And the part is in Madison Heights, Michigan. And they said, can you get that and get it to your station? I said, we can. He goes, well, they close at 4.30. He calls me at 2 o'clock. And I said, yeah, we can get it. And he goes, now my next problem is how do I get it to the ship? And I said, well, why don't my van go to Madison Heights, get your part, and drive straight to Gary? And he said, that'll work. So uh, by 7 o'clock, we had the part on the ship. The ship was started, and the ship was on its way. So we do things like that. Uh, we run back and forth to Sault Ste. Marie to the Sioux Warehouse, and we'll drop things off for them. And, uh, that maybe somebody requires uh, it transported them for them. Uh, groceries, we run everywhere. Uh, I've been to Sandusky. Uh, we've been as far as Duluth with different things that we've taken for boats, uh, emergency part. Um, another steamship company one time had a part on a ship in St. Clair, Michigan, and they needed the part in Duluth. And we had it there in 12 hours in our van. We just sent our vans directly to St. Clair to park and got it right up where it needed to be. And, uh, you know, when you start thinking about logistics of getting somebody to get it, get it to an airport. And, you know, and now for me personally, what compelled me to, to stay working there and like this job was the different things that we do. 
I found it very interesting that when you go to work every day, you're doing something different. Uh, you might go for a boat ride in the morning. You might go for a van ride. You might not go for any ride. Um, but there's always going to be something cooking. And uh, when I first started there, I, uh, I remember getting a phone call and they said, hey, uh, you feel like going to Novi, Michigan, picking a part up? I said, yeah. And they said, well, how do you feel about Lorraine, Ohio after that? And I said, uh, <laughs> Christmas Eve. So, uh, so I got the part and I got the Lorraine. Merry Christmas. I think that was a Christmas of 86, maybe, or 80, maybe 87. I can't remember. I don't really think it was. But uh, yeah, anyway, that was what I liked about the job. You know, you're always doing something different. Yeah. Well, how far up in the uh, lakes do you go? Do you go up to the seaway, St. Lawrence? No, um, our little railroad will pretty much only operate in the Detroit River. Um, you may see us as far as I've been up into Lake St. Clair, and I've been down as far as Colchester and Lake Erie for doing things. We had a ship that was broke down one time at Colchester and they needed parts and they needed our boat and they needed a service man. So we loaded up the part, we loaded up the service man and we sailed all the way to Colchester, which is about three, three and a half hours on our pilot boat. And we uh, got the part aboard and we waited for the service man to repair it. And then we brought the service man back. And uh, we've done that twice. And then there was another time we had a boat that was anchored out off of Colchester and they had promised the crew they could go home for Thanksgiving, the people that were there already. So they wanted to do a crew change. So we took the new folks out and picked up the other folks and brought them back so they could go home. So those are kind of rare. We don't usually go that far. Is there anybody else through the lakes that does what you do? Well, we're the only boat that is exclusive with US mail. In fact, we're uh, probably uh, the only non-military vessel that is assigned a zip code. We're the only one that actually will come alongside moving vessels with U.S. mail that's not a government uh, enterprise. Now, there are other mail boats, like if you're on an inland lake, somebody's probably seen the YouTube video where the kids jump off the boat and half kill themselves, drop the mail off of people's cottages. Well, that's not what we do. We, we only, now, in terms of what we service, uh, if you have a yacht and you're going up the Detroit River or you're one of those many sailing ships that go by in the summertime, if they have mail, we go out to them. And uh, everything from a small boat to a thousand feet long. Does the U.S. Postal Service also have mail boats? No, they do not. We are the only, as far as I know, we are the only contracted mail boat that services moving vessels. They, 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 and they don't, as far as I know, they don't own their own vessels. They contract that service. Yeah. Were you aware that a former mayor of Toledo used to run a similar service here in the port of Toledo? No, I didn't know that. Uh, he was married during the 70s, Jerry Kessler. His nickname was Bumbo Erie. Oh yeah, Bumbo. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, we're kind of a, we're kind of a bum boat, except we don't stock anything. We have to go get it for you. But it's, it's kind of a nightmare trying to get things because even like with cigarettes, I can have three or four or five different varieties and they will want the variety that you don't have, you know, and it'll always be on a weekend or something. And do you uh, deliver alcohol, beer? No, okay. no. Uh, most of the ships, uh, huh? No, we <laughs> well, yeah, uh, not knowing when. Um, we, we have, when it's been um, a situation to where, um, you know, how they do some of these freighter raffles, and if the company said it's okay for us to take it out to their ship, yeah, we would do it then, but generally we don't get into that. Cigarettes is our only vice, probably. Um, yeah, knowing when you never know what's in the U.S. now. We don't, I, I do cat scan it when it comes through. I wave the cat over, and if it meows, it might be some <laughs> <laughs> we were doing that after 9 11. People would bring their bags in, and I would wave the cat over the top of them, and they were looking at me all puzzled. And I said, Well, this here, is a, this here cat can smell stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What's the range of fees for these different things that you decide that you do that like what's the most expensive thing that you um, well, if you are uh, getting your Amazon package and it's, uh, say, under 20 pounds, it'll cost you about $10 to get that. Um, now, if you're if the weight goes up heavier, then we just adjust it a little bit at a time. So say you have a package that's 30 pounds, it may cost you $15. If you're putting, uh, say, uh, a personal suitcase off or something, most of those things are covered by the companies that we service, and we have billing arrangements with all of the companies to um, for their passenger fare 
and also for the uh, for their luggage that goes aboard and anything else. But say like a, a large suitcase would be about eighteen dollars. Mm -hmm. um, a person to go on or off a boat is about a hundred and twenty. And that goes up, uh, that can go as high as, uh, we have different rate structures for different companies that um, um, do more business with us. We have some that will pay us a service fee, um, kind of like a retainer maybe you might want to call it. Those folks will get a better rate because they're constantly doing business with us. Um, but uh, it, it will just vary, uh, like somebody may drop something off, say you have a person that you uh, have on the boat that you're related to, your husband, or your wife, whatever, you can bring in something that they may want, and it's usually a flat fee of about $10, unless you're like this one fellow that drops off 400 pounds in weight, then it's going to be a little bit more, you know. Um, what about those trips where you go, you sail for three and a half hours? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, those are billed out at a per hour rate. And then again, it'll depend on the company that we're dealing with and the time of year that we're dealing with it and what we have to do to, to do it. So sometimes it's more convenient than others. We have a fleet of three vessels. Oh, by the way, I should talk to you about that. We have the J.W. Westcott II, which is named after J Captain J.W. Westcott's son. It's actually a person. It wasn't because it was the second boat. A lot of people think that. Um, and that was built in 1949 at Ash uh, Marine Yard over in Erie, Pennsylvania. And then we also have one called the Joseph J. Hogan, which is uh, named after um, uh, the current owner of the J.W. Westcott is Mr. Jim Hogan. And he's a direct descendant of J.W. Westcott. It's his great-grandfather. And Jim's mom is actually a Westcott who married a man named Mr. Joseph Hogan. And that's how the Hogan name comes into the, into the company now. But um, we have one named the uh, M.S. Westcott, which is named after Graham, uh, uh, Jim's grandmother. And she was married to J.W. Westcott II, and he unexpectedly died in the, in the 1959 or so. And so this woman ran the company on her own for many, many years. And um, her daughter, um, uh, Mrs. Westcott, uh, Mrs. June Westcott, who was married to Joe, they took over and between the three of them, they were able to keep this company afloat. And there was some pretty hard years there uh, when the boat started uh, diminishing and money started getting tight with the postal service. And, and there was some pretty hard times there and they kept her afloat. Do you contract with harbor pilots or are they part of your employees? Um, well, uh, we, um, uh, first of all, our biggest contract is with the U.S. Postal Service, and then we um, contract with the Lakes Pilots Association and the Canadian uh, Corps of Professional Great Lakes Pilots. So, uh, so, so you know, there is American pilots and there's Canadian pilots in our district, and they share those jobs. So not, not quite half or maybe more than half sometimes when they go up will be a Canadians on and off. And the other ones would be Americans on and off in our in our area, and our area um, of pilotage will be from the Welland Canal all the way to Port Huron. And um, so they are their own company, and they 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 those entities uh, contract with us. What size are your service boats? Okay, our JW Westcott the second is forty five feet long. It's about twelve feet wide and drafts about four and a half feet. And she has a service speed of about 12 knots. Um, our MS Westcott, which I'm happy to say was built right here in Toledo at uh, H. Hansen across the river there. Hans Hansen, as it used to be called. Uh, they built our boat in 1979, and it went to the Lakes Pilots Association. And then as they've been building new boats, they sold us that one. So we named it after grandmother. And we have the Joseph J. Hogan, which is only 40 feet long. And it was a Corps of Engineers survey boat built up in Marinette, Wisconsin. That's all, yep. How many women worked on the ships? You know, I knew somebody was going to ask me that, and I come prepared for that. Uh, right now, um, I have a, about a 20 person crew, and seven of them are females. Yes. Yep. Yep. I'm a stamp collector, and I want to put a plug in for the Motor City Stamp Club. Could you explain uh, how they've capitalized on your business? Sure. Uh, the question is about the Motor City Stamp Club, the Stamp and Cover Club. And you know, if you're a philatelic person, you're collecting different envelopes that uh, uh, might uh, chronicle an event or uh, something that happened. And each year, the Motor City Stamp and Cover Club would create a cover of our opening day and our closing day. 
and we would stamp it special and they might have a special a picture of the boat or something else that's uh, going on that year and they've done that every year they're still continuing with that and we have a collection I, I used to think it was pretty neat to look back over the years and you could see when we started when we finished every year and that was pretty cool that's always nice having them they still have their picnic down in our place too so yeah yeah one other thing uh <clears throat> Back before the Westcott, there was a lot, a lot of other companies that the move you mentioned. <clears throat> and was there one called the Wilmer or the which one am I thinking of? Uncle Paul over there. I worked with him for 30 years. <laughs> that was the uh, um, I'll think of it here in a minute. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that. The question is, is there anybody else that did what we did? And you know, right off the bat, JW Westcott had some employees. Uh, one named uh, Homer Elverson and the other one was named Riggs. And they decided that they'd break away from Old Westcott and start their own act. And they, they did for a while, but they quickly found out that the steamship companies, they just trusted J.W. Westcott. And they, they may have uh, wandered for a minute, but J.W. Westcott was smart and he, he aligned himself with the Steel Trust. And that was his bread and butter. And in those days, that they had like 100 boats. So uh, when you're aligned with someone like that or an entity like that and you have their trust and the other thing with J.W. Westcott, like if you might remember, there was a great steamboat race on Lake Erie between the Tashville and the city of Erie. You all remember that in 1901? Well, there was a thousand dollar wager based on that. And uh, they figured out who's going to hold the money. So that was J.W. Westcott himself that held the thousand dollars. And we still have that agreement in our archives of, at work there. You know, we dig through the archives every once in a while. I was looking at 1956 the other day, and I noticed there was something like 25,238 boats that went by our station. And uh, so I asked the guy working with me, I said, hey, you were born in 56. Uh, what time were you born in the day? He says, 345 in the morning. And I went through there and I found out what boat went by at exactly 345. And they were going by, there were 65 downbound boats past our station that day. And uh, it was one every five minutes. I said, it was not a problem. And so then I started going through some of the record books and looking at how we had a fellow, uh, Frank Zuzak, that worked for the company for 57 years. So I looked at the time book and he worked 12 hours every single day, the entire navigation season, but they had put him in for 13. And I can only assume that they were giving him like a one hour shift premium or something. But this man worked this way for years, for like 57 years, his longest employee. And uh, he worked nights, 12 hours, like seven to seven or six to six or something like that. Nowadays, we work three shifts. We work uh, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., 3 p.m. to 11, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And my two sons, uh, Shane and Joe, they run the boat on the night shift. So, um, and they like it. I've been trying to kick them off the night shift, but they seem like they like it over there. So we let them stay on there. It's actually a very nice shift to work. You might think working all night would be not so much fun, but it's quiet. No boss, no boss over me. No boss over me. No boss in between me and the big boss. And no boss and, you know, no Uncle Paul over there. Uncle Paul over there in the yellow there. Uh, this uh, Paul Jagginall, he was our longest dispatcher other than Frank Zuzak. 42 years? 42 years. Golden voice of the Great Lakes, we used to call him. He had a radio voice like nobody else, let me tell you. And not average how many votes do you have We average uh, about 5,000 or so per season. Um, now, on a shift, uh, the other day I had two votes, and then uh, a previous watch down there, they had something like 14. Uh, the most I've ever had in one is about 24. Now, Paul here probably had 30 or 40 back in his day because he was there 10 years before I was even there. So, uh, you know, we uh, it was well known that we had over a million pieces of mail a year at one point when mail was the real big thing. And people said, well, how has that changed over the years? I said, well, instead of getting so many letters, you're getting big boxes from home. And I see people that send boxes that have like $100 in postage on them. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of letters, you know? And, uh, but we still do get um, letters. I mean, and you know, really, there's nothing like a letter. I mean, you can send an email or a text, but there's nothing really like a handwritten letter. I wish people would get, we have one staff member. She loves sending cards. Her name is Sharon. She will send a card for every occasion. And it's like, you know, you still have your great aunt hanging out with you with Sharon. So I started sending her cards back. So uh, we're, maybe we can get something started here. 
<laughs> what else? Uh, another, not, not, not to bring up sad subjects, but I know the Westcott went down once. How many times has that happened? Uh, we have only had two fatalities in the 150 year um, history of our company. And it was that day, it was on October 23rd of 2001. Um, our boat went out to do a pilot change in the river, and we were a little off station. We were a little bit down river further than we normally are. And, you know, if you ever have an accident anywhere, I don't care if it's a car accident or you fall down your stairway at home, there's usually a chain of events that start leading up to how you how this happened. And with us, it was probably, we come up with about a dozen different things that all went wrong and fell into place and ultimately ended up with our boat sinking. That was a new pilot. We had a newer uh, boat captain, and you know, we we really, um, you know, you have a lot of folks that have, you know, in the small vessel world, you have people that can seemingly obtain a license with, but the person that we had on, on that day, you know, they had a license, they'd been on much bigger vessels, and what it was was a just a series of events to where the ship had not checked down with show. You have to slow down and do a pilot change. If you're going the full river speed, our boat can keep up with you going downstream, but when you come alongside and you got the wake of the ship going, and then most of our pilot changes are, are, are they're focused more in the danger zone of a ship, which is the aft third of the ship. And when you get back into that um, area there, you really got to have everything going just right. And, you know, when you have um, all of our vessels are single screw, so there is no backup there if you were to lose your engine. And even if you have a twin screw vessel, that's not even on a guarantee either. But it can be a very dangerous place to be. And uh, when our what happened with our boat is it simply um, was going, the, the ship was going too fast for us. And as, uh, as it would happen, um, just a whole lot of things went wrong at the same time. It was dark out. The weather wasn't good. And um, if you look at the Coast Guard report, it's fairly accurate, except for the simulation that they did. The simulation was a little bit off. And I had to be there the entire process from the time it happened to the time they actually raised our boat off the river. And it's pretty gut-wrenching, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody that you ever have a uh, I hope nobody ever has a tragedy of any sort, personally or otherwise, because it's the worst thing in the world. And uh, with our boat, she more or less rolled over. And if the only good thing that happened that day was the two passengers, which were pilots, they both survived. And uh, one survived as a result of our ring buoy coming free, and he was able to catch that. They both had life jackets. In it. Uh, but the problem is, is uh, life jackets inflate. And the one fellow found out that his life jacket inflated while he was still in the cabin and he couldn't get out. But he actually had a bicycle with him, a fold up bicycle, and it floated. So he was able to float with that bicycle. And then when the boat went down, it didn't completely sink. It was under the water, but um, the, our vessel is designed to have watertight compartments. So the one main compartment at the bow never did flood with water. So she kind of stayed buoyant, kind of on a 45 degree angle. And then we found out that we didn't have the infrastructure in the port or anywhere near the port to raise a sunken vessel. You know, you really find these things out after it happened. So they went to try to pick our boat up and couldn't do it. So we had to wait another week because the weather turned bad. And so it sat there with a buoy in the middle of the river and as a hazard to navigation, you know. But, uh, the other thing that came out of it was the, the community around us. People were bringing us food and flowers and condolences. And the Coast Guard was just the greatest. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, you think of an authority branch of the government not being like having a heart or something, but they really did. They were they were really good. So uh, long story short, we uh, refloated the vessel and we put it back in service the next year. Uh, yeah, that was after my wife told me I couldn't do it. She looked at it. She goes, you can't fix this. And I said, we can fix it. I said, remember that first house we had? We fixed it. So uh, we, we can fix this boat. So uh, we did it more as a testament to our crew members than anything else. I wasn't going to let it go go away just like that. So, wasn't there a similar service in the Pippi and the Maumee Rivers with rain boots? No, oh, there were. Uh, yeah, there were bum boats in all, most of the ports: uh, Cleveland, Lorraine, Toledo, and there were a lot of uh, marine chandlers everywhere. 
and they all went out of business. And we watched them one by one while we just kept going along. But I owe that to the fact that we've had great, we've had great leadership with the Westcott family and the Hogan family, great leadership, and we've always diversified. And if there was an opportunity to do something, we would do it. And we just pretty much never say no. Whatever you need, we, we think we can, if we can get it on our board, we will get it too. And I, I've had I've handled some pretty unusual cargoes. When is your navigation season and has it changed? Uh, our navigation season is the question, and it's uh, pretty much the first week of April to the last week of uh, December, give or take. Um, and the only thing that we we have a contract with the Postal Service to run for 252 days, so we do that, and then. Uh, there were a few years where we had opportunities to run later doing other things. So you might have seen, I had the boat out in January one time and the ice was getting a little bit too much for her. So uh, it actually froze me to the dock one time. I had to use some hot water to unfreeze me, but uh, you know, it's not much fun out there that time of year. Yeah. You see any uh, changes, changes or things happen in the next 10 or so years coming up? You know, um, Everything seems to be pretty good and steady. Uh, the whole business and the marine business in the Great Lakes has been changed by a lot of companies uh, either selling or changing. And of course, there's personnel challenges nowadays. Um, yeah, everything just seems to come at it, you know. And then, of course, the competition with rail and things like that. But as far as we go, we just keep, uh, like I said, we just keep plugging along and uh, we just never say no. We do. Uh, another thing that we do is water sampling. You know, the ships have their own water on board and they also have their own sewage systems. So every quarter, those things have to be tested. So we take the water samples and the sewage samples and we take them to the lab for testing. That's another service that we offer. Um, at one time, we were the largest nautical chart dealer in the whole Great Lakes. And now that uh, charts have went more or less electronic or um, uh, the government to, went to a print-on-demand feature to where you can call and order a chart. You can still order a chart from us, but we have another party print them for us now. And the question I thought I saw handed. You, since you work right on the boundary between the United States and Canada, are there extra restrictions? They know both. Um, uh, the question is, is there extra restrictions on what we're in international waterway? So I can pretty much uh, go and come as I please, except I'm, if I anchor in Canada or I stop in Canada, then I would be subjected to the same regulations as everyone else. So we don't do that except for when a ship anchors in the Canadian anchorage. Uh, I don't know, is anybody here from the Detroit area there? Are you familiar with the Detroit River? Well, we have two anchorages in the Detroit River. One is the Ojibwe anchorage, which is in Canada. And then there's the Belle Isle anchorage, which is just off of downtown Detroit. Sometimes the ships anchor in Ojibwe, sometimes they anchor in Belle Isle. And if we have to go to Ojibwe to take the pilot off, then we're technically in Canada, but we're really with the ship. We didn't land in Canada. But what we don't do is, if, say, if a ship is at a dock in Canada, we don't go there anymore. We used to. We used to get fuel in Canada. But everything kind of changed after 9-11, so we just don't do it anymore. Jordan, did you have a question? Uh, yeah from online and just sort of following up on some of the others in terms of how things are changing and trying to say other things. You guys ever started using or consider using drones to deliver some of the <laughs> You know, that would be a lot easier probably. Uh, you know, uh, we have a guy that works for us. He actually operates a drone and takes some great pictures. But, you know, I think if the drones can put stuff up that's pretty heavy, uh, that might be a thing. Maybe we could start doing our people that way. <laughs> uh, the... Uh, Maybe some of the pilots like show when they want to go on a drill. Well, speaking of people, how do the pilots get off the ship? Oh. And into your boat? Yes, a great question. They have a, a rope ladder that comes down the side. Now, if the ship is too high, they may actually have a combination of the accommodation ladder and a rope ladder. But that's how they get aboard. They have to climb up a rope ladder. Now, with some of our lake ships, they'll actually put a regular aluminum ladder over the side of the ship. It sets right on the deck of our boat while we're moving. And we, yeah, we get it going, and uh, and that's the thing. I you know we're training our people. So you, you might come in and say, "Hey, I'm a boat captain." Well, you know you're going to be a boat captain that has to dock alongside moving things. And I can remember 
when I first started, uh, we had some old steamboats they'd fit out down here in Toledo, and they were uh, they were using a lot of steam engine oil, and it was coming by the barrels, and they were having muscots deliver. And I used to have to go back up under the stern of the ship to put the. And I'm like 20 years old, right? I just got my license. I'm like, what is all this, you know? And you're up under the stern of a ship, and you're trying to maneuver and make sure that everything goes right and get it aboard, and it's just. You really got to, I'm not saying, I'm not bragging on myself, but you, you got to know what you're doing when you're, especially when you're transferring people while you're moving. And you ever, you ever try a boat here? Yeah. Just, you know, they've never tried that. And I, I've had some people jump from the ladder sometimes. I had a guy one day, I rode him alongside and he just kind of jumps out of the gangway. I'm like, why? Why, why would, you know, and we always tell folks, take your time. We've got all day. I get paid by the hour. So uh, we got all day to come get you. I had a friend who used to catch his uh, boat uh, on the West Coast, and and he would have uh, two duffel bags of small TV, and I wouldn't have been surprised if you would have had to tie him onto the mail bucket and they both towed him up. <laughs> well, the weirdest, the weirdest, the weirdest thing I ever had, probably with people coming off a boat. I'm not kidding you about this one. Now I get a call from the ship. They said, "Hey, we got a guy having a heart attack. We think can you come up the river and get him? Because we're not sure if we're going to make it as far down here." So we race up the river. We get alongside, and I can't believe what I'm seeing. But I'm seeing it. This guy is coming down in a chair. They tied him to a desk chair. And they had him wrapped up. He looked like he was in the electric chair. Okay. So here he comes. And my dad can't hardly take a lot of pictures. And he says, I'm going to take a picture. I said, no, you are not going to take a picture of this. And uh, so we get alongside. We run into downtown Detroit. We tell the ambulance people that were at the police station. You think they could find the police station? So I got this guy in the chair wrapped up. A guy trying to take a picture of him in an ambulance going around with all these sirens. But finally, we get the guy into the ambulance. And he, he was not having a heart attack. It was some kind of a, just chest pain. But they had tied him in a chair. And down. So that was one of the weirdest ones. Oh, okay. Well, water levels present um, nothing much for our vessel, but uh, what happens is, uh, like, say you have a, a good southwest breeze, and like in the last couple of years before the water levels were high, then the ships can't get down the, the river in the lower Detroit River. So that may cause them to go to anchor. So then that means that we're going to have to go to the anchorage and retrieve the pilot, or we may have to, something we were going to do out front underway is now going to be an hour or a deal because we had to go up the river. That's one of our challenges. Um, we've had at times where vessels have went aground and we've had to run parts and supplies and surveyors. And we've even carried the Coast Guard, even though they have more boats than we do, they've hired us to take their inspectors places. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that our cruise ships that are coming in, uh, we service them with a lot of their, they'll send all new napkins and menus and things like that. We get whole skids full of freight for them, uh, parts, uh, you name it, that, that what they need. But uh, one of the things for us, the biggest challenge with the high water is our boat was coming over the dock and they had to extend the dock up a little bit because it kept banging into the dock and you know wanted to come ashore. <laughs> we don't like it coming ashore in the middle of summer. But uh, I see there's some hands somewhere. Karen? I've got a, a couple here. Yep. Um, first of all, um, and this is an aside, this isn't even a question, Mark Skursky, who is a longtime member, is sending you and, and your colleagues a late thank you because in 1972, one of your boats took, quote, a delinquent deckhand out to, out to his boat when he missed his boat in St. Catherine because of some very good looking young lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I've got somebody else asking if uh, does your neighbor, the Detroit Fire Department, ever cook for you guys? No, we do our own cooking. Uh, we do our own cooking. Uh, we kind of stay on our side of the fence. Uh, yeah, they don't cook that good over there. Uh, we got some. Uh, no, no, they're not real firemen. That's why they don't cook good. Now, we do have a fire truck there for a month. When Detroit was remodeling a firehouse, they sent a truck over to the fireboat station and they stayed there for a month. And now those guys could cook and they knew how to party and they never got one run the entire month. That fire truck sat there. I think. I think they forgot them all. But uh, so now we still have the side of the fence. Plus, we, uh, we've got Walt in the daytime at Westcott. I know Walt knows how to make an omelet, let me tell you. 
Um, uh, as far as the, uh, we, had a, we had a pair of sailors one time that were in love on the ship and they missed their ship in Nanticoke. So they come to the mailboat to catch it. And then they, were, we, they wandered off for a minute and uh, then the ship's coming and we had to go retrieve them from the Crest Motel up the street. <laughs> and uh, we've had, I uh, had one sailor run on one time and then he comes walking back and the girls who was what stole his car. And uh, <laughs> we've had people um, roll in and miss their ship and then the ship won't take them after they drove all the way from Cleveland or somewhere. Yeah, but have they like quit? Have them come out and say, take me off the boat, I quit. We absolutely have. The question is, is, has anybody ever quit? Oh, yes. We've had, I had a lady, uh, what was a lady and a guy last year. They made one trip. They got out of the suit and they got off at the mailboat. And the lady says, you know, I'm a deckhand. Where, where I, she was from Jacksonville, Florida. And she goes, I'm a deckhand. And up here on the lakes, they've got me in the engine room. She goes, I'm not an engine room person. And this other guy, he got off. He says, I don't like that captain, so I'm not staying. And then uh, we put a couple of guys on one time, and the boat called us back and said, come get these guys. We don't like them. <laughs> And our best one was when we put the wrong guy on a boat one time. That was pretty good. We had a boat coming down the river, and he was dogging it, waiting for this guy to show up. Well, there comes a knock at the door. Here's the guy. She's sharing the deck hands on. She goes, come on. She calls everybody monkey butt. Come on, monkey butt. You got to get on this boat. So we take him out. We put him aboard. <laughs> and, and this guy doesn't even know what boat he's getting on, apparently. So then they call us about 10 minutes later and say, we don't know you just put a board, but can you come get on this? <laughs> So we've had people that show up one time from uh, you know, with the lakes. You usually always used to get folks that worked only on the Great Lakes, and now we're getting a lot of folks that work on the ocean too. So when they come here, they don't quite understand that we're going to take them out. We had a couple of guys come in thinking the boat was coming in to get them. <laughs> and we, they wandered off, and we had to chase the boat all the way to Grassy Island. And they, once we found their guy. Okay. And um, we've had... Uh, uh, we're such a kind of an institution in Detroit. Again, we're, we're Detroit's, one of Detroit's oldest businesses, and I'm, I'm just proud to be affiliated with them. I mean, one night the police come rolling in with three Polish sailors, and they said, we didn't know where to take these guys, but they said they lost their boat, and they don't. And what they had done was the boat was an anchor at Belle Isle. They went ashore for some shore leave, and then they got lost in Detroit. So they were up near Eight Mile or somewhere, and the police come dragging them back to West Fast for us to take them back to their boat. They're like, we fair, you guys were going. <laughs> I mean, I have people in, in the city bringing me uh, reptiles. I think because of the mailboat, I had a guy bring me a turtle one day. He says, we figure you guys might know what to do with this turtle. <laughs> I put it in the river and I said, this is where the turtle lives. <laughs> he said, we figure you know what to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you talked about like the weight. I mean, you showed us our bucket and everything. How do you take these big unwieldy things and, and get them up there, whether it's the 400 pounds or, I mean, some of the weird, I mean, I know you guys put bicycles on the boats and this, that, and the other, like, what's the process to get those up there? Okay, well, I like handling the bigger things than I do the smaller things because they're usually being mechanically lifted. So we take our high-low out and we'll, we have a 3,000-pound capacity high-low and we can take the heavy things out and we put them on our boat. And then when we get alongside the ship, we have already arranged for one of their mechanized cranes to lift it off of our boat. And it just goes simply up and over and away. Um, uh, you know, it usually goes off pretty easy. I haven't lost too many things. Uh, thank you. I will knock on wood that we don't not lose anything else. But the heavier things, like heavy crates and things like that, or drums, or that, that's usually a lot easier. I'm not saying that whether or not I roll an 80 pound box or something, because I'm going to have to lift that thing. How many suitcases did you Yeah, it was Phil over, and he's over, and he's one of the lakes pilots I'm talking about, but I told him he's going to come over to have me tonight. Uh, you know, we don't lose too many, but I will tell you a good story about suitcases. Uh, we used to, uh, a guy shows up one night for a book called The American Man. He drops his bags off. He says, I'm going up to the bar. Okay, great. Well, about that time, an entire crew shows up for the Ford boat on a star breach that's coming down the river. So they're all in, they're making noise, they got coffee, they're going crazy, all this stuff. Well, here comes the North Star Breach, and I said, all right, everybody, the breach is coming, grab your stuff. Well, they grabbed all their stuff, they grabbed everything. 
So the witch goes and he's heading to Pillsbury and Buffalo. So the guy comes back and says, Hey, where's my, where's y'all put my bag at? I said, I have a good idea. It's on here. I'll start a preach. But sure enough. And they passed each other in the room because the man was going up on him. He says, Hey, we got your stuff. So, and what's even better is if you put the wrong stuff on the wrong order, they keep it. That's even really good. And they know it doesn't belong there, but they don't give it back to you for a couple of weeks. So, if you look at a map south of Detroit along the Detroit River between um, there and down to Wyandotte, there are vast hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of industrial land owned by different companies all along the river. Any chance of any of that land being redeveloped or sold and developed to homes or? Well, a good portion of that land we're speaking of is owned by United States Steel Corporation. Uh, they own the entire Zug Island, which uh, a lot of people go, why is that island called Zug? It's named after a guy named Samuel Zug that was a furniture maker, just so you know. And uh, Henry Ford turned it into an island when we dug the shortcut canal into the Rouge River. Um, I don't know how that land could ever be like really developed. There's one small park in River Rouge uh, named Bellinger Park or Bellanger Park named after a doctor in River Rouge. And then there was the old shipyard that was there. And then there's more in the United States Steel. But if you get south of one and uh, it's, there's been a lot of preserved wetlands, and it's really great. I live down that way, so it's pretty nice to have all that is protected. So, from further development, you, you don't see that. Yeah, you're pretty good once you get down through there. It's really good. If you look at Friday Island, when I started working, the entire south end of Friday Island was completely barren, and now it's all full of trees. So, really beautiful down there. Yeah, uh, I've seen pictures of. Uh, Hatch type doors on the side of a ship. Is that easier or harder to load? Is that a problem? No, yeah, that's easy. We always run them back there to the hatch and we can just generally step across. People can come in and go out those doors real easy when we're doing a transfer of freight. Um, at one time, we handled all of the sundries for American Steamship Company. And that's how they all got transferred through the door. We had everything in our warehouse for them before they got sold. Uh, and we would put for 50 years, we put this stuff aboard, whether it was paper towel, spoiled paper, whatever, it all went aboard. And it's so much easier. And on the cruise ships, the way we do it, they open the door and we can stick everything in. And that works out really, really well. Otherwise, if you're on the old steam boat, you're putting a rope over the side and everything goes up one rope at a time. And, you know, uh, I had been used to, when I started in the West Coast, I had been putting roofs on and stuff. So I was used to carrying bundles of shingles, but nothing had prepared me for 80 pound bags of water softener salt when the freezing spray has hit me. And, you know, we go out in any kind of weather, we just have to adjust for it. If the wind is blowing out of the southwest in the Detroit River, you can encounter six and seven foot waves when you're alongside the ship. So you're going up and you're going down. You can jump up in the cabin and you can get a little air time. It's kind of fun on your way back. But don't hit the ceiling. I'm short, so I don't have to worry about it. But the tall guys do. But um, like if we're doing a pilot change or a pilot change in this kind of weather, if you're ever in Detroit and you observe a really windy day, you, you might see the ship up in the upper river there turn sideways for us. They're creating a lease so we can go alongside and do that job. Do you have a question over there, Terry? Um, I did. I and this is going to be probably more historical versus your mm -hmm. time, but um, was there any time when the Westcott Company would um, work with and take provisions to lighthouse keepers in the Detroit River? Mm, I don't think so, but I wouldn't put anything past uh, what J.W. Westcott would have done. I mean, I had a friend, uh, he died in 1913, so I, I didn't know him, obviously. But I'm going to guess that he didn't say no to anything, so if there was something to be done, he would do it. Um, yeah, then that's how that business has just been, you know, over the last 148 years. So um, what else we got? Is there any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, where are you? Oh, yeah. I'm the Diamond Jet. We're probably on the Diamond Bell, I think, probably, or the Diamond Queen. And we do the pizza, and then awesome. We uh, we used to do 700 pizzas a year with different cruise boats. That's what we do. Pizza, pom. I mean, it's a lot. Sicily's Pizza loves us. In fact, some of the boats have made their own pizza carriers, and they painted them like a Sicily's box. And what we found out is those big Amazon boxes that they deliver your stuff in, those are excellent for putting pizzas in, because you can zip them up and it keeps the pizza warm. So, uh, 
Uh, we do a lot of that, believe it or not. Um, just, uh, just a ton of it. Now, when nobody asks me the question that everybody always asks me, and that's what's the strangest thing you ever carry. And one of the strangest things, Uncle Paul probably has some insight on that, but one of the weirdest things, uh, I went alongside the George A. Stenson one time, I'm taking people off, but all of a sudden I hear, nah, what's up? <laughs> they hand me a goat. <laughs> and then I have goat. I'm like, what is, where did this come from? And they said, well, they were on a trip on the boat, and they were up north, and they got this goat for their petting farm in Ohio. So we were going to charge him for the goat. And the guy was complaining. And I said, well, we only charge you for two legs. We're going to charge you for four. We charge by the pier, you know. But, um, but uh, the captain on the Hoover St. Jackson used to take his dog with him sometimes. And this dog was so big. We had to put it in the grocery waste, and we had to go back aft, and they'd have to put the grocery basket down, put this dog named Susie in it, and Susie would go up, and then the chief on the Columbia Star, he always had one of those Siamese cats named Nigel, and Nigel would go up on the road, he had a cat carrier, and one of those Siamese cats, they talk more to me, it's up the side, it goes, you know, and, uh, but that was kind of a weird stuff, I wonder if drunken people that show up or, you know, get fired and they're mad. <laughs> What do you do in the time in the winter when you're not sailing? Well, um, you know, uh, that's a good, very good question. What do we do all winter? Um, and in the old days, um, people always worked seven days a week. They took the winter off. That was their kind of time to go on vacation. Well, I don't like the winter anyway. So I, uh, what I do is um, I shift over to a job uh, with the ships in the wintertime. I do a, a winter work on the, on the Great Lakes freighters. Um, other guys um, have other jobs. Some guys snow plow. Um, I used to clean houses in the winter time. You know, anything I could do, and then around March or so, we would start fitting our boats out. Our our owners are are very strict on the maintenance of our vessels. They like them completely painted every single spring. They like everything inside and out repainted every spring. So we do all of our winter maintenance then. And uh, but for me, I leave. I actually work down here in Toledo uh, when the ships come in uh, for the winter time. That's what I do. And three or four others on my staff do the same thing. But yeah, we've had guys that were snowplow guys, uh, you know, neat cleaning houses. I'm pretty good at it too. <laughs> so a few years ago, one of the Babalo boats was here, and um, it was getting finished up before it went through the Great Lakes, and then I think to New York City. And it was facing the future as a, um, a, a tour boat out of Manhattan, I think. Do you know whatever happened with that? Oh, you had the Columbia down here on the dry dock at Toledo Shipyard. Uh, they spent uh, 1.7 million on it, I do believe, redoing the hull. And it's in Buffalo right now. Um, the man that had been, um, they're still trying. I don't know if they'll ever get it running or not, but they are trying and considering its historical significance to this entire area of region of the country, I really wish they could, could get her going. And you know, the other one, the St. Clair that was here as a haunted attraction for a little while back in 2002 or so, you know, she was actually built right down here in the Toledo shipyard. And I was so hoping maybe you could find a home down here where it was built. I mean, it was it's, it's everything Toledo. They uh, they picked Toledo Shipyard to build her back in the day, so in 1910. So um, I was kind of hoping, uh, but it's sitting up in Detroit right now. And they they were building the St. Clair, and they were welding on a wooden you know superstructure, so you can't do that. <laughs> Well, the cruise shipping business is getting bigger and bigger and bigger each year. In fact, Viking is going to have another large ship here next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are, our involvement with that is going to be uh, transferring the pilots on and off. And also we are, um, I've, you know, very close. Westcott has contracts and contacts with pretty much every agent and every shipping company. So we make, you know, they just simply have to call me wherever they need. And um Pretty much everybody calls us, say, hey, we need a sewage truck. Where can we find one? Uh, we need a water truck. Where can we find one, you know? So we, we arrange a lot of that stuff for folks, but uh, Great Lakes Cruising, I believe, is only going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, the, the only thing that's ever hampered that here has been the, the short season that we kind of have. But I mean, you know, if you start talking about the spring and then you start talking about the fall colors and things like that, it, it's actually... Uh, Pretty long and pretty nice, I think. Uh, it's still not 
Maybe it got to the affordability at a price point that maybe some of the folks in Europe that, that come over here and do it from other places in the world, they feel it's uh, it's pretty, you know, it's worth every penny on it to be able to see this part of the world. I mean, it's the largest bit of fresh water anywhere on the planet, so. And they're on several riverboats, and everybody wants to see the great white. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like it. Yeah, I thought I saw somebody with a hand somewhere. There you are. You got a lot of me over there. I forgot okay. you were over there. Um, I've got a, a, another Zoom attendee who um, wants to know how can they mail a, a letter from the Westcott? Basically, they have a letter just mail. They want to go somewhere, not to a boat. But they want it stamped. Oh, you just stop on by our station. I always encourage people to stop in at three o'clock in the morning when my sons are there. Uh, <laughs> you know. So you're saying your station is open? Sure. Walk around, walk yeah, we, we have people running down there on tax day trying to get their tax forms in on the 15th of April. Are you kidding me? Some people just like their Christmas cards close by. And we really, we're open to people. We like visitors. We, we love folks to come in. Phil has coffee with us once a week. So uh, Harry there hasn't made his way up. But, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we really like to have people. And people do just show up. Uh, I had a guy show up one time at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, he used to work there. And I, he goes, Hey, I used to work here. I go, It's three o'clock in the morning. Why are you here? And he says, Well, I couldn't sleep. So I thought I'd come see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Has there been any, any books been written about the West Coast? There is. Uh, there's a children's book uh, called Mail by the Pale. And it's available through the Wayne State University Press, where you can actually come buy it at our station. We'll even sign it for you on postmarket if you like. And then there was Westcott, the first hundred years, uh, written by a name, uh, 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 a guy named Gary Bailey, and published by Blue Lake Green Press back in uh, 1974. But uh, that's about it, as far as unless for something you can find online. And you can always look at our Facebook page too. It's uh, uh, Mailboat JW Westcott, the two. You can keep up with us. We post pictures. Well, maybe every day we have a cat, a cat's name Cat Thing. So people always demand pictures of the cat thing. And they're still wondering about how heavy she's getting and how many treats I'm giving her. And uh, so we really do rec recommend if you're up in Detroit, it's a great place to come. Actually, we have a lot of things to see. And the West Coast one of the more unique things that you'll ever visit. And we're really friendly. And uh, you can come up anytime. Got it? One more. One more. Got one more. Just kind of curious about boat handling. Mm -hmm. Major differences when you're pulling up beside a thousand footer or a uh, hundred foot cruise ship. I mean, you, you know, um, it depends on the speed of the vessel and some of those uh, vessels where they've made them wider uh, and added uh, bodies to them. They'll throw out kind of a weird weight. Um, upbound is a little bit different than uh, downbounders. Um, the weather has a lot to do with it. And then the location where I'm going to bring the boat alongside. Up floor is kind of easy. The middle is easy. Gets a little trickier when you're going back towards the aft end. And, and we pretty much, um, our people we have a lot of training to do this. Uh, we, have, we like to get folks that we brought in as a deckhand and just I have a guy I'm working with now. So when he's done, he'll have 360 days of training with us. And, um, yeah, and by that time, you, you pretty much figure it out um, because it's, it's kind of weird. It's different than just coming alongside a dock somewhere and, you know, you've got to get your boat. And then there's the weird things that we get to do. One time they wanted to inspect a bearing on a thousand footer. So they, fill, they, they, they tipped her is what they call it. That's where they fill the front end with water and they get the rear end up out of the river. We had to turn our pilot boat around and then back underneath the ship. Underneath the ship, yes, we did. And so they could put their men under there and inspect that boat. So I said, my, I love to send my boss pictures of crazy things, whether it's the hat or what we're doing now, especially if he's on vacation or something I like this. This is what we're doing with your boat now. But uh, those are the types of things that they go through, river into different places. And uh, uh, one time there used to be a tug and barge that would come down and they would like to transfer their people from the tug to the barge. So I would have to take them off the tug, run around up into the notch of the barge and then let the people get aboard. And we were doing that for quite a while. So all of a sudden we're up in the notch where the tug boat belongs. And, uh, so that's what I told you. I love the job. The job is cool because you're always doing something different. 
And you won't ever do anything quite like that anywhere else. So I, you know, so it's been great. And like I said, we love people, we love visitors. We have a small bookstore there. We got some souvenirs, uh, and we always have free coffee. So you want <laughs> coffee? Huh? We're only for folders, by the way. There are coffee snobs up there. So. <laughs> Westcott's still involved. Sure. Uh, Mr. Jeff Horgan that owns the company. He, his great grandfather was J.W. Westcott, and now his son Jimmy is the fifth generation. And he will be taking over uh, the helm from his dad uh, pretty soon when the, you know, when the dad decides he's going to retire. His dad has nearly 50 years of service with the company himself. So um, while he's still at it every day, you probably like to see that uh, Cracker Barrel rocking chair maybe once in a while. I don't know. So uh, but uh, yeah, that's it's, and that's been the thing too. Is their family kind of a you know we're kind of a family family uh, unit there. You know, everybody knows everybody else's business, and we're always in each other's houses. So we never leave the job at the job; it comes home with you. Oh, we do that all the time. I've pulled more people out of the river than the fireboat has. <laughs> Uh, I've played both. I've had, uh, you know, I bumped into something at three o'clock in the morning one time. It was a person that had been missing for 30 days, and I found him. Uh, we saved uh, the last one I pulled on was a young girl trying to kill herself. And, uh, you know, I never really fool with people, but I always ask them, hey, do you want to be saved? You know, I roll up to her. You know, I beat the fire boat there, and she's in the river, and I'm asking her what's going on. My boyfriend dumped me, and blah, blah. I said, listen, I make new boys every day. I said, why don't you come on my elbow, get right off, and we'll all be good. So we pulled her in and took her, and the police were able to take her to the hospital and get her some help. But I mean, a lot of people, and 100% of the people that jump in, they all decide they want out <laughs> after they jump in. I can tell you that. Whether they jump off the bridge or they jump off the park, they all went out of the river. And we saved a guy one time that actually jumped off the Ambassador Bridge. He fell 156 feet. And, and he went, and not only did he live, he floated a mile downstream and still went in no zoo. Oh. And with no poison. <laughs> so uh, we get a lot of folks that just, they end up, and I've saved, I've had, I come up the river and you see something swimming across the river. It's a dog. I put a dog in one day and I put a dog in another day. And, you know, we just uh, dry them off, take the blood water to them and send them on their way, you know. And uh, I asked the dog catcher people, I said, how do these dogs end up in the river? They said, well, a lot of times they're just running from something else and they figure they'll jump in the river. So we always pull them out. So I, I, we pretty much put anything we see floating down the river and we call it a man overboard trail. <laughs> I had one question back there. Oh, uh, we always have a cat. And uh, this cat here, we got it, uh, we adopted it from the shelter, and nobody, and it was, nobody else wanted this cat. So, yeah, we went over there and we said, we'll take the one nobody else wants. So that's it, because they didn't have a really good personality. So we've had to get her adopted, you know, we got her adapted to where she likes humans now. And plus, I give her those temptations treats and cat nap every day. She's my best friend. Other than putting her tail on my oatmeal every morning. Now, too. And we couldn't come up with the name, so I said, get this darn cat out of my oatmeal one morning. And then I said, that's his name, Cat Thing. How about that? <laughs> and so we put it on Facebook. So like I said, if you're on the Facebook or anything more about JWSCott.com, you can look us up. Or if on the Facebook, uh, just add, you know, we'll put you in there and we can kind of keep updated with what we do every day. And again, I would urge you, if you're in Detroit, look us up. Uh, we're there, you know, until the end of December this year, and then we'll be back at it in the spring. So, yeah. well, thanks for having me and not throwing some eggs. Yeah. 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 All right, Sam, thank you so much. That was amazing. I will point out, just because I see Shay and Jill here, every year at our annual fundraiser, the Westcott Company is very generous and donates two trips aboard the Westcott um, that you can win via either our um, uh, raffle or you can bid on at our H2O function, which is now also online. So if you've had so much fun standing here listening to Cap and Sam today, think about that next September and buy a raffle ticket and or come to our event and uh, do it. Because is it awesome? Yeah. Um, so this is our last of the year. I um, look forward to uh, announcements in the early uh, 2023. Holy cow. 
Uh, for our lecture series for next year, don't forget, if you're interested, this weekend is our Fitzgerald Experience tours on the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker. You can sign up for those. Um, and then our Christmas tree ship will be arriving the week after the week after Thanksgiving, the first weekend in December. I'm going to say the weekend after Thanksgiving, I think the week and a half later, but most people mean the next day. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know that our Christmas cards came in today. Put them up here, yeah. Um, and so Ellen has those for sale outside if anybody is interested in getting their Alex Cook 54th annual Christmas card. The man is amazing. He's 98 years old and still making our Christmas cards for us. Um, so check those out. Um, as always, um, if you are here and enjoying what you're seeing or you're online and enjoying what you're seeing and you're not a member, please consider joining um, and visit nmgl.org backslash membership where you can join us for, as a member and learn more about all of our programming. Other than that, I hope everybody has a really fantastic holiday season. I look forward to seeing you guys in February or March at some point. All right, thanks.